So to begin, I'd like to start with an acknowledgement. We honor with gratitude the indigenous peoples whose ancestral homelands all firewood banks occupy. We will continue to work as allies toward indigenous community access and self-determination in natural resource management on these lands. Thank you all for making it this morning. And um, I'd love to go around and, and do some introductions. So if you'd like to say your name, where you are calling in from, um, what your connections to wood banks are or, or the story of starting your wood bank, and um, and how you best like to process wood, whether it's for your wood bank or for your own personal firewood. So I'm Kevin Brady. I'm with the Nativity Wood Bank in Bend, Oregon, which is uh, three miles, uh, three hours uh, south of Portland. Uh, we've been in business for about 18 years, um, and uh, I'm one of the leading members of the team and do a little bit of everything. So as well as heating my own home with wood. Thanks. Next person can jump in if you'd like. Hi, I'm Stephen Yolman. I'm in Holderness, New Hampshire, and I just started a wood bank this summer. Um, I work at an independent uh, boarding school, um, nine through 12. So uh, getting the students and other faculty and staff involved. Hi, I'm Kristen Norwood. Um, I Massachusetts um, DCR Community Wood Bank Program. I'm a seasonal forestry assistant, and we basically um, assist wood banks with startup and um, maintenance um, to maintain their wood banks. Um, let's see, we have four that we were working with this past season and helped a couple of others um, get their grants in for startups for this next season. Thanks. I was trying to find the uh, unmute button. This is, uh, I do good with heavy equipment, but the laptop kind of throws me off and my wife's busy, so I have to do it on my own. Uh, my name is Ed. I'm here in Springfield, Missouri. We've had a wood bank for 14 years here in this local area. And um, uh, we work with a lot of different agencies around here doing safety training and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, getting ready to start it in the uh, spring, helping some rural churches, getting some wood banks going in their local areas, sharing what we've learned over the years. Uh, I also travel to the Navajo Nation in uh, New Mexico and Arizona from time to time and help them with uh, wood that they have and wood that people bring there and drop off logs. Um, yeah, they're not always prepared to process the firewood there, but we'd like to go over there and help them uh, now and then. And uh, very, very happy to be a part of all this and grateful to those of you who organize it and um, connect people on Facebook and different things. It's been uh, uh, it's been very interesting for me to see and encouraging to see that there are more people out there doing it. I do it pretty much by myself anymore. We had lots and lots of volunteers in the first couple of years. The news came out every once in a while, and it was a it was a big deal. But uh, as happens, people get older, they move on, do different things. So. Um, to me personally, it's encouraging to see all, all the rest of the people across the country doing it. My name is John Ackerley. I am the head of the Alliance for Green Heat. And um, my favorite tool is the ax. And I still haven't hurt myself. Maybe that's why it's my favorite. Um, and I actually, I was on the, the meeting earlier this morning, eight o'clock, and I thought it was such a good dis uh, discussion that I wanted to join this one. But because I've already been through and I'm hoping that my colleagues, Pam and Darian, will they they can chime in more on this one and I'll I'll listen more. Because uh, Elisa and Ed, who's also on there, they've already heard what I have to say. I 
I'm Darian. I'm calling in from the Arkansas River Valley. Um, like John said, I, I work at Alliance for Green Heat. I help out with some of um, the grant programming. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm Pam Porter with the Alliance, also for Green Heat, and I live in Madison, Wisconsin, and I uh, have a wood heater in my fireplace, an insert, and we burn about two cords of wood, sort of sort of supplemental heating in our house, and our wood comes from our cabin in the north woods of the UP, where we have a hemlock and maple forest. Um, so there's always a tree going down up there, so we... we uh, gather up the wood and bring it down to Madison and use it here in our in our fireplace here, in our wood stove. But it's nice to see your faces. I recognize a few of the names from some of the grants this year. So nice to see you all. Nice to see you, Stephen and Kristen and Kevin. Thank you all. That's awesome. So some of the questions that um, that you all wrote in with your registrations had to do with uh, liability insurance and with, oh, we have a, we have a young member as well. That's great. <laughs> and, and with, um, wood processing tools, specific tools that would be helpful for wood banks. Um, so I don't know which, which direction we want to go first, um, whether we want to talk about equipment and, uh, and PPE, there were questions about, uh, what's the best log splitter <laughs> for a wood bank, um, what what keeps your volunteers the most safe? And maybe we can talk also about um, training training procedures, training any kind of safety training that you do with volunteers or that you encourage wood banks to do. Um, what what are your practices? I know Stephen, you're just starting out, but. <laughs> Maybe it's just you. <laughs> well, Lisa, I'd be curious what everybody yeah. thinks about splitters. If you want to start there, I, I, in managing these grants, we, I just noticed that there's all kinds of splitters that people choose to purchase, and I kind of wonder how to objectively choose the best splitter for the best price, and what criteria do people look at? I know Kevin went out to get one of the one of the splitters from Canada that have had some acclaim. But I just wonder what y'all think about the size of a splitter, whether you know whether you need a side log roller, a table, great place a side to start. engine, all that. Um, I'm planning to get a rugged made wood splitter. It seemed like the best splitter that I could get for a reasonable price versus like the um Easton made and Timberwolves and whatever that are over 10 grand. Um, has the log lift and the table great. Uh, I have a friend that has one has, has really liked it and it has it's pretty strong. The thirty seven ton. Um, so, Stephen, this is Kevin yeah. and Sam had uh, alluded to a little bit, but we had the opportunity to purchase a an Easton made Ultra uh, this year, and uh, the lesson that we've got from that. Um, more than anything else is that the that the factor that, that everybody advertises about tonnage uh, right as the size of the machine really is is pretty much irrelevant what's really 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 significant is the cycle time right. how long does it take for that to go out and come back yeah. and um, the 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 alter we purchased is i mean just amazing i can't recommend it strong enough but right. it's very expensive right so, if you are looking at uh, a normal <clears throat> big box level surf splitter, um, I would recommend strongly that you look at the Champion. Yeah, um, it's it's a, it doesn't have the log lift on it, um, but if you're just doing a regular size splitting, it's very fast, um, and it's faster than all the others that we run into. But as you look at them, I would would actually test or have somebody test with a stopwatch how long does it take it to go out and back both with no load and no load and with with load and with no load because that's really the governing factor and you know and, and the all 27 32 7 ton i mean it, it really doesn't make any difference unless you're splitting you know real crappy wood with with lots and lots of knots right so kevin kevin is the cycle time the, the due to the hydraulics of the ram or 
or what makes it go faster or slower? So it's it's the size of the ram. So and the and the flow rate of the pump is what what governs it, right? So um, if, if you've got a, a a big ram, okay, with you know five gallons a minute flow rate, and that's and then you've got that same pump. I mean, it's going to go at a certain speed. So if you got a big ram at a, at with at a at a flow rate. It's going to go at a certain speed. A smaller ram at the same flow rate is going to go faster, okay? But it, it won't be as powerful. So it's going to trade off back and forth, right? So, you know, what you what you really, the only way they access this day is that, you know, go look at it with a stopwatch, you know, and and uh, and just see what it is because it makes such a difference. With, with these hey, do they advertise that that spec? Like the, the most cycle card? Don't. Oh, still. You, you, they are doing that now. The ones I've seen haven't. So if they are advertising that, then that's fantastic. But um, otherwise, if they're not advertising it, ask or or test it yourself. With the um, you know, faster, bigger pump, but you also need a bigger reservoir or your the hydraulic is going to overheat. Yeah. Yeah. Have you already purchased the Rugged Maid? I have not. Yeah. Are a wood bank that we work with, um, Peter's Ham, um, purchased one and it comes, you have to assemble it yourself, just right, so you yeah. know that. Yeah. Yeah. They actually um, were just working on assembling theirs um, late this fall, so it hasn't gotten used yet. I, mm -hmm. I don't have any feedback on that. I'm sorry, what, what brand was that? Curse what brand were you buying stuff from? What was it? Rugged, Rugged made. made. Rugged made. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I've used the horizontal vertical tilt ones and I don't I know like bigger pieces you can flip it up vertically, but I find that harder to wrestle the pieces on the ground, like onto the splitter versus using one with a log lift. Well, I, the log lift is much preferable. I agree with you. We, we've got a, 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 a an Easton made we bought about five years ago uh, with a log lift and one of their 1024s. That's a great machine. We use it for just for just killing the big stuff. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of, of ponderosa pine. Uh, we get it from the from the arborists in town. So we'll get it's not uncommon. We'll get we'll get some of these things that are 36 inches in diameter. And uh, having a big splitter for that is very important. I've actually found it useful to have one with a lift and one that can go horizontal vertical if that you, if you have that possibility. Um, this summer, we were working with stuff that was so huge and we were in a confined space. So we, we have an Easton made and we weren't able to use it there. Um, so we have a just one from Tractor Supply that goes horizontal and um, vertical, and, and it was very useful for breaking down the gigantic rounds. What's the advantage of the horizontal and the vertical to, to your, in your perspective, Kristen? Well, um, why do you do? Why do you, you can it? break down um, a gigantic log without having to lift it up. So it, it sits on the ground. You still oh. have to like kind of lever it and wrangle it over to the machine, <laughs> um, which I fortunately had a partner this summer who was in his early 20s and strong. Um, so even we have an Easton made and even some of these rounds would have been like too big for that machine. So the so the big pieces you kind of wrangle into the splitter and then use the vertical, yeah, and it it and kind of can even break the round apart from the outside in, you know, because these were just it depends what kind of wood you have. These were giant. <laughs> so, Kristen, one of the things that we've done with those really big rounds is we've also used the vertical on them, uh, but we'll have a have uh, the guys with the saws uh, quarter them. Oh yeah. Really mm -hmm. It's it's much safer than trying to wrangle those really big ones. Yeah, yeah, for your back. <laughs> yeah, and your toes. Yeah. 
We I actually, was... uh, my coworker or um, boss, Sean Mahoney, is looking into, um, we found out from another wood bank down south that they have a an attachment for their skid steer um, called a Halverson. And it can be used, it has a bar for cutting to length and a splitter, and they actually just use it for their bar because the skid steer can lift up the log onto the machine, cut it to length, and then they make piles of rounds that way. So it's a very safe way of, um, I guess, making rounds for splitters. You know, the manufacturer of that, that would be interesting. Halverson, H-A-L-V-E-R-S-O-N, I believe, or S-E-N. But if you Google it, it comes up. You can find them used or new. We're looking for safer ways for not having to chainsaw every round as well. I think it depends on how much help you have, you know, the age of your help. Uh, like you said, sometimes your confined space, not confined space. I've been using uh, just an Oregon with a um, with a collar engine, a little eight eight horse collar engine, uh, for a long time. The wedge is actually on the ram. It doesn't have the pusher on the ram where it pushes it into a six way head onto an out outflow table, and you know, if you have 20 people standing by to stack wood, then, you know, your big ram or your high speed flow rate and your table, all that kind of stuff would be great. But when you're two of you, or for most of the time, it's just me, my little 22 ram, 22 ton ram has been working great. Um, so I think like a lot of things in life, it depends. It depends on how many people you have, where you are here uh, in, in Missouri. I split very few pieces of softwood. Everything is hickory, oak. Um, we have locusts. Uh, we have hedge. If you're familiar with hedge, horse apple, bodark, they call it different things. Uh, one of the hottest woods, hedge and almond wood. I grew up in California splitting almond wood, and I didn't know that it was way up high on the list of BTUs, but it can also be very hard to split because it's a hard wood. So anyway, my two cents is it would depend on uh, where you are, what you're doing, how many people you have helping you, all of that kind of stuff. I I save a lot on counseling and therapy because I just go out for a couple hours and work with the wood splitter just myself. I have my, have my helmet on and my earmuffs on and uh, sometimes put my earbuds in, but not too often because I'm getting older. I need to pay attention to what I'm doing, but uh, it's pretty good therapy and it's a lot easier on my shoulders than swinging them all. Um, so anyway. No, we had an interesting experience a few years ago where we had a, a guy that liked to split by hand and um, he, he was actually faster than the big box splitters. Oh. He couldn't last as long, obviously, but uh, just from a you put him head to head, he would split more word in the same amount of time than, than the, the, uh, the, the splitter guys would so yeah that has a that has a real fast cycle time you were talking about hand splitting yeah. and something i saw on youtube years ago and i tried it and it works really well is uh take an old tire and you put it nail it onto a big stump that's yeah. a stump maybe 10 inches off the ground so you can still get a good swing and then you put your rounds inside the tire and you just hack away and your wood doesn't go flying everywhere you don't have to stop and pick it up and uh, but yeah, like I say, I can go about about an hour and a half with them all, and then I'm uh, two bottles of ibuprofen for the next week to get over it. So we have a um, a group of volunteers um, that uh, on a on a Saturday during distribution uh, will have uh, as many as fifteen volunteers, maybe twenty. Um, but during the most of the year, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a core of like 10 guys, 10 folks. And what we've discovered is probably the fastest and most efficient way to run these splitters is to have at least two, sometimes three people on each individual splitter, where you'll have one guy running the handle, 
another person loading and a third person unloading or keeping the you know it coming and going and that gives us the advantage that because we have a lot of people that uh for age related whatever physical relations can't do a lot of lifting right so they can stand there and run the handle all day long and so we've got room for you know that level of volunteer to come and stay with us and support us um, and then we've got the guys that uh, that are you know muscle bound and they need all the extra exercise and so we put it to work that way but we you know you get multiple guys on the same same splitter you can get a lot of production through them if you yeah. have I, having enough volunteers yeah and on volunteers having worked with them for probably i don't know 35 40 years um as a youth pastor and taking missions trips and that kind of thing. If you manage it really well, you can get a lot done with volunteers. Um, but we talked about earlier that you get a couple of guys. You, uh, My dad used to say, you know, one boy's a boy, two's half a boy, and three boy is no boy at all because they'll start competing. They'll start getting in trouble. Uh, but if you can manage that or you have, you know, you, uh, it's kind of like um, the um, the ratio, right, for training. You need to have, uh, one supervisor for every five boys if you're going to have splitting malls and and sharp objects and <laughs> wood flying here and there. But if you manage all of that, you can get a lot done with all of that, all of that muscle and testosterone. Uh, but the safer bet is to have several girls on a <laughs> on a hydraulic splitter because they're not competing. They just say, hey, this is what I I was asked to do. This is what I'm going to do. There's no competition. So there's give and take. But the at the end of the day, we all want to go home with our fingers. So how do you manage safety practices and safety training or or what have you seen at, at wood banks that you've worked with, Kristen? Oh, um, for what the, do you for, the, for saws, for, for dealing with, with chainsaws, we limit the number of people that are allowed to use chainsaws. Uh, we, we've got the saws, we provide the saws. Um, and uh, those people have been trained by, we're fortunate to have a, a couple of guys from the Forest Service that come and go, and one Forest Service guy that's regular. And he's actually, or at one time, was a certified chainsaw trainer. So uh, we use him for the chainsaws, um, for the splitters. Um, when we've got a, a, somebody that's new, they go through some some hands-on training. Uh, we have the the people that are actually running the splitter and watching out for everybody's fingers. They're a trained and experienced person that's been doing it for a while. Um, so that's pretty much how we deal. And then for the, for the guys that are there loading, you know, we just say, watch out for the guy backing up. You know? Same with us. Um, we limit it, limit the chainsawing to, well, so we're a state agency working with wood banks. So we try to prepare our rounds, um, ourselves ahead of time and maybe like the actual community's wood bank coordinator might do some chainsawing as well but most of the volunteers don't have you know, the firewood rounds are already prepared so they're just splitting and stacking or moving firewood um, so as far as splitting we we do a hands-on demonstration with um, the people who will be operating at the time of the volunteer event. I do the same thing, Kristen, where I cut up ahead of time, have enough for whenever I have volunteers. And right now I'm the only one running a chainsaw, which I love doing. And I also trust myself more with a chainsaw than some other people. <laughs> well, well, one of the things that we have found is that having a variety of different jobs opens up our base for volunteers because you've got some guys that want to come split you know like the one guy that did it by hand that's what he wanted to do right and you've got some guys that want to come play with chainsaws well that's great we're going to teach you how to do it and stuff like that and some people that want to volunteer that don't have any specific skill or strength and we've got space for them also so uh, by by opening up and just keeping everybody safe uh we've got uh, got the ability to increase our our uh our volunteer base. So, and I know there was some discussion and concern about insurance. Also, is that uh, uh, we're fortunate that we're we're associated with a with the uh, 
with the church. And so we're actually a writer on the church's insurance policy. But uh, we have a, 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 a liability release that uh, we all our volunteers sign every year. We update it once a year. So. And that was done uh, through one of the volunteers who was an attorney, right, who, uh, who actually created that for us. So. We have a volunteer liability release as well. Um, and usually each town that we work with has their own. So at the beginning of a volunteer event, um, they make sure they have those distributed and signed. We actually do a couple of um, volunteer events with students from the University of Massachusetts has worked out well for us. I don't know if people are looking for ideas, but um, there's a particular class at UMass that requires a community service project. So this fits in perfectly with that. And I got to work with a couple groups of students in the spring and a couple of groups of students in the fall because of two semesters for the same class. So that works out well. That's a good idea. Hey, one thing uh, it came up on the, the, the uh, session this morning was to have especially if you have a lot of volunteers, have one volunteer man a table where your liability forms are and all the PPE. So before anyone reaches the site, they have their earplugs, their safety glasses, their gloves, um, and their uh, chaps if, if they're gonna be using the chainsaw. And I just never thought about just having a table with all that stuff on there. So it's really easy for everyone to see and grab and that who's ever in charge, you know, can easily make sure everyone's using what they need to use. Yeah, John, we, we've actually this year actually evolved that to one further step where we've actually got a shed for that right now. But actually, what one of the things that we've discovered is for the last few years over a while is that actually the hardest job in our organization is uh, coordinating um, wood pickups and volunteers and all that paperwork. So we actually, this year, we were fortunate to be able to, we've actually got a, a part-time person that we've hired to do that. Um, who, cause, because for distribution, uh, people call in for an appointment to come in. So we control the number of people on any particular Saturday and we control the, the amount of wood that's given out. Uh, people are allowed to take it, take wood like once a month. Um, so she coordinates that for us also. And believe it or not, that's actually the hardest job in the whole, the whole organization. So uh, it's, it's, it's definitely worthwhile having a person focused on that. We used to volunteer for that for a long time, and that worked fantastic. Uh, but she got burned out. They got burned out. So it's definitely worth having. Stephen, you're on, on mute, Steve. I'm talking to my toddler that's eating lunch across from me. <laughs> I was going to throw in something about equipment, uh, not to get away from insurance, but to include with insurance. Uh, because I, I teach uh, truck driving as one of my one of my training things I get to do at my the big nonprofit where I work. We're always talking about um, weight ratings. Uh, power unit ratings, safety chains, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in between the morning meeting and the evening meeting, I ran into town, which was probably 12 miles to the truck stop, to weigh a trailer that I have loaded where we're going to um, take some sawmill slabs to a church. And even though I'm not going to cross any scales, uh, you know, you want to make sure that that it's within the weight rating rated for that trailer. And so I just throw that out earlier. Somebody said that um, in the earlier meeting, when somebody, when people come to their uh, bank to receive wood, the people volunteering there, they don't even load the trailers. They let them load themselves. So you put your load on your pickup and or your trailer and it kind of releases the wood bank of having the possibility of overloading. Uh, when we go to disasters and give people uh, people come to the church and they in pickups and trailers and they want to load, you know, water supplies, whatever it is that we have taken down there after the hurricane. And 
we will load a certain amount of stuff on their vehicle and stop. And uh, they, you know, they want to keep going because there's still room. Well, did you read the rating on the tire? There is, there isn't room left. So anyway, I wanted to throw that out there. Uh, I know that's not foremost on a lot of people's minds, but uh, you know, with insurance and uh, John talked earlier uh, this morning about in this country, you know, he didn't use these words, but somebody can sue you because you're wearing the wrong color shirt today. Uh, so, you know, we just have to take every every precaution we can. And one of those things is obviously overloading a vehicle, which is very easy to do with firewood in general. But again, lights, brakes, safety chains, all and on and on. So just one more thing about equipment and keeping yourself covered from from being liable because you are the one that loaded their vehicle. So, yeah, we 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 experienced the same thing. Ed, we've got a one of our clients comes in with a trailer that was just absolutely not acceptable. I mean, it was just a piece of junk, and we refused to load him. Right, he needed wood. We took him wood, and then we helped him get his trailer up to speed. Right, but uh, it's this is the same idea. So. What kind of trailer did he have, Kevin? What do you mean by junk? Like it was just a. Well, so it was a one of these uh, uh, home built trailers with you know you take the back of a pickup right and you put the, put the just put a tongue on the end of it. It was that, and it wasn't very well made, right? Um, the the, uh, uh, the the tongue connection was the wrong size, and his trailer ball was the wrong size for the tongue connection and things of that nature and, and uh, so you know it was a it was a pretty obvious thing i mean we didn't go in and evaluate the lights or anything like that but this just from a, a structural standpoint it didn't look comfortable <laughs> i wonder if if um you all have dump trailers and what you think about dump trailers versus not dump trailers and and where you buy them if you can get them used and you know, I, I I live in Wisconsin, so there's a lot of farm equipment that we can get a hold of here. But I just wonder what what y'all think about so, that. So we use we've got three dump trailers that we use, um, a 12 footer and two 14 footers. Um, we were fortunate to be able to get them donated to us uh, over the years, um, and uh, we could not do our job without it because uh, because because not so much for deliveries we do some deliveries but we try to limit that but mostly because we do pickups where the 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 uh the, the, for the our arborist will take the tree down uh, on somebody's property and then that that property owner will donate the wood to us we'll go out and pick it up right um and we couldn't do it without this so the other thing that's really important uh is uh getting rid of the of the trash uh, we've got, uh, we probably take 200 cubic yards of, uh, bark and crap that comes off of these trees to the recycling every year and doing that without a dump trailer would not be possible. And we got to get rid of it because you, you can't walk on it, right? So, so, and we've, uh, we started off with, uh, with uh, Richard and I uh, purchased a used one from a guy that he knew um, and uh, that ended up getting stolen, but uh, that was another lesson learned, lock your stuff up. Um, and uh, since then we, we, we were able to, to fund out of our operations, our first one, uh, and then we had, uh, had, had some ones donated. So yeah, you can get used ones. It's and our okay. trailers sold by, like, do you look for payload like you do a truck? Yeah. I mean, how, how do they what 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 spec do they use to, to, so that you know you've rated got a trailer load, that can carry load. weight? Yeah, rated load. Yeah. So rated, okay. you, rated, you know, if you go look at it, you can see pretty pretty self explanatory. So it's it's going to be length and load. No, it'll all be in the spec. Anything, often. Buy, anything that you buy in a twelve foot length is going to have more load than you need. So I'm sorry, Stephen. Oftentimes they have the weight rating, and then you look at the weight of the they'll have it sometimes but you look at the weight rating and the weight of the trailer and subtract that and you'll get the payload of its capacity but, but um, i'm sorry as i agree the i'd like to get a dump trailer some of because it can actually move the weight of wood some of these um like smaller utility trailers they might have the space but they just don't have the weight capacity to move like a full cord of wood 
and a trailer is a lot cheaper than a truck and you can't move a full cord of wood with anything smaller than a one ton truck. Yes, I'd be interested. How did you get trailers donated? Were they donated by um, a distributor or were they used or new? So um, the, the first one, we actually did a little, little bit of a fundraising um, to, to, to get it. Um, um, again, some through the church and some through the community. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the third one, we actually had a guy who was an occasional volunteer that came. And he had one, and we borrow it from him on a regular basis. And one day he called up one of our, our leadership team, and he said, hey, meet me down here. And we went down there, and he gave us a trailer. Just, you know, he liked what we did. You know, he thought we helped a lot of people. He liked to be involved. Uh, he asked that it, that it be anonymous, you know, so he didn't want anybody in the woodlot to know we'd done it. But uh, um, the, uh, and on that, on, on one of the ones that we had, we purchased, we had uh, uh, the father, the elderly father of one of our members, uh, donated three quarters of the cost. So, it just uh, partly that comes from being associated with the church and the community, but also in the community for a long time. People know what we are, what we do, uh, and we're not a town of ten thousand people either. We're a town of, of uh, you know two hundred thousand people in in the area that we service. So. Um, that helps that there's a larger base to go on. But, you know, probably you just got to ask. Nice. We we actually have two dump trailers as well and find them useful um, for even just moving wood around on our site. This summer, one of our wood banks was in a very small area, so we had to dry our firewood in a totally separate location from where we were processing it. Um, not to mention it was very wet where we were processing it um, with a rainy summer. So it's just been yeah, very we, useful even for moving stuff around. So so one of the things that we purchased two years ago that has been uh, a big thing that I don't hear talked about a lot is that we had a, we bought a, a, a conveyor elevator, right? About uh, 10, 12 feet long. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a 16 foot long elevator. And that allows us to to uh, move, you know, we're splitting here, we move it over there. You guys don't have to throw it, you know, as high. And uh, that was, it was uh, relatively inexpensive. I mean, the, the ones that the firewood guys, you know, like Eastman made and, and those guys, they sell, they're very expensive. But this one, we got this and, you know, showed up at our door for less than $4,000. So it's a, it's a good use for the grant. So I came from a, a group in, uh, in, in the Carolinas someplace, or it's called uh, Chipper LLC. Was it new you bought that conveyor, new? New, yeah, I think it's actually made in, in Norway or someplace like that, based on the markings on the box or Germany, something like that. And uh, a little Honda engine on it, and it worked great. How much do dump trailers cost that you've seen used or used or new? What's the... What is that you price? Know, I, to I don't remember. Let me see what Google says. A new is going to be around seven, eight grand. That's what it is in our area. Um, I would, I would, um, not that you need caution, but if if somebody has a dump trailer, uh, you're right. You can put more weight on it. You probably have seven or eight thousand pound axles, so you're going to gross at sixteen thousand, which is great for especially moving wet stuff or. You go somewhere and somebody uses their skid steer, they're giving you a bunch of logs or a bunch of rounds. That's great. Uh, the downside is some states are, I hate to be Debbie Downer here, but some states really are cracking down on the whole CDL thing. And being a CDL trainer, uh, we have people in our state, and especially in Oklahoma, where they just have a gooseneck to haul their horses around to go to the rodeo, and they're getting pulled over and getting a ticket because they don't have a commercial driver's license uh, because the horses inside the trailer, uh, they call it commercial because you could make money at the rodeo. Obviously, they've never been to a rodeo and had horses taken to a rodeo because it's it's a losing proposition, not a winning proposition. But all that to say, 
before you, I know none of nobody here is talking about getting really big with traders, but before you get too big, make sure in your area that you're not going to get in trouble because you don't have the right licensure. Um, because that happens around here to the to the average Joe Blow trying to move his tractor from point A to point B or his horses or load of hay just on a gooseneck uh, behind his behind his pickup. Uh, so I again, not to be a downer, but that's the kind of stuff I teach all the time. So I wanted to make sure that you check that before you get get too big. Now the ones you're talking about, you know, to move six, seven, eight thousand pounds, maybe ten thousand pounds, you're probably in good shape. But once you get up into the 15,000 rating, you may have um, uh, old Smokey Bear around the corner looking to, oh, these guys are moving this wood back and forth. What are they doing? So just, just so check on it. Your area. He used to make his quota, right? So. Ed, what, what's a gooseneck? Is that the where the ball is on the trailer? Yeah, the gooseneck goes over the tailgate and hooks into the bed of the pickup. And so that uh, distributes the weight uh, more toward the front of the pickup than the rear of the pickup. And you can Typically, you're going to have a lot more weight on that trailer, but in general, not again, not everywhere, but in general, with the Department of Transportation rules, when your trailer is rated more than 10,000 pounds, that means you can, when it's loaded, it weighs more than 10,000 pounds, uh, and com combined with the towing unit, you know, you're getting over 26,000 pounds. When you get over 26,000 pounds, you're moving in, you're moving from, I'm renting a U-Haul for the weekend to I'm getting up into the truck driver class. And typically they know you're just moving wood around and your neighbor's helping neighbors and you're okay. And most everywhere, I think that's how it is. But like I said, here, um, we're at the Southwest corner of Missouri. So it's only 80 miles to Oklahoma and it's 40 miles to Arkansas. And there are a lot of those uh, law enforcement people cracking down on the average Joe moving hay and cows and horses and so just a precautionary note for your to to research your area so you stay out of trouble because it can be, you know, if you overload your trailer here anyway in Missouri, if I that's why I just went and weighed my trailer and I was pretty happy. I was 500 pounds underweight. So I guess my slab load pretty good. But if you if you are rated for one rating and then you are caught and they weigh you and you're over your weight rating here they call that a registration violation with like a max of 150 dollars but my big concern is and i teach our guys while we're we're teaching truck driving if you are in an accident or something happens like that and you were a thousand pounds over your weight rating uh now somebody's injured or killed or whatever and you were you know now you're not a registration violation now you're in big trouble so Again, just a precautionary note, uh, because that's a world that I live in for the DOT stuff. Bigger is not always better, in my opinion. You know, I can I can look like little Joe Blow moving some wood around because that's who I am. I'm not a I've never I mean, I've given away probably 1400 pickup loads of wood and helped with over 120,000 pounds of wood on the reservation. And I've never sold a stick of wood. So I really am Joe Blow, not out here for commercial reasons, but I need to keep looking like Joe Blow. Does that make sense? Like, you know, Billy Bob just running down the road with a little bit of wood. If I had a, my luck, if I had a gooseneck, they'd pull me over and say, hey, what, what are you doing? Where are you going? But I'm just putting around with my little trailer, my little three-quarter ton pickup. So trying to stay under the radar. So in terms of in terms of insurance, what do you um, with all of these different parts of a wood bank with the the vehicles and the tools and the volunteers and training? Um, how do you how do you think about that or how do you manage that? Um, and and like you were talking about how it often it often takes uh, people to specific people to manage volunteers and manage safety training. Um, who do you put in charge of of figuring these things out? Having heard all of this now, I think I want to quit. It's pretty scary. <laughs> Just teasing. So we've just kind of evolved over time where um, we realized that, uh, hey, get a couple of guys show up with chainsaws and maybe they weren't as being as careful as we wanted, right? 
So we got into a situation where he says, no, if you're going to chainsaw for us, you're going to have to be certified, not officially, but you have to be, you know, at least talk to our experts on it <laughs> to see what you're doing. Um, we had one situation where we had a, we were out doing a pickup and all of a sudden I realized that we had 10 guys with chainsaws on this log pile working it. And that just didn't make any sense. It was stupid. Right. And so, as I say, it's evolved over time. The same thing with, with, uh, with, with our coordinator is that, uh, you know, we had to coordinate the, who was coming to pick up what and when, and we had volunteer doing that. And the first one did it for a couple of years, then a couple of years. And then we got to the point where, hey, we needed to have somebody who was really, you know, guaranteed to be able to do that. Because at least from our standpoint, from the from the people that are running this thing, that literally is the hardest job because you can deal with all these different people and keeping track. And that's away from the fun stuff, at least in our mind, you know, so... Um, and, uh, and, and then from there we evolved into, well, you know, what sort of insurance do we have? And fortunately, again, we were able to do it under the church, you know, as a right of the church policy, but we actually had somebody, we had a, a, a uh, an insurance canceled on us one year because they thought we were in the, in the, in the lumber business, right? I mean, it goes to your point, Edward. So somebody, we had, had, had a log truck delivery, a self-loader log truck, but delivered some logs to us and somebody took a picture of that and posted it on our Facebook page and the insurance company said you guys are loggers we can't insure you so it took us it took us a while to get through that you know it just kind of as, as we worked our way through it as we got to it so um we uh it, it's been kind of an evolution I think is the point I was trying to make something you said Kevin uh sparked a memory in me which is surprising that I remembered something I get pretty excited when I remember something uh, this year I went through Montana and I was able to stop at a wood bank in Montana, met some guys, a recipient of the grant, met them through the Facebook page and traveling through seeing family. And I stopped to see them and they, we've done that here with our, with the other nonprofit I work with. And they did it at the Montana wood bank. Uh, steel came and did some training, some free training for the folks there with um, some steel representatives uh, came to their wood bank and had an all-day training on chainsaw maintenance and usage. And I thought, that's great. We, we've had that here with our big nonprofit. Three of us drove the four hours to the regional distribution center and uh, took a free steel training at the steel distribution plant. So there, there is a lot of... Um, from in place to place, you know, that obviously it's going to be a regional thing, but uh, there are some good um, trainings. Now, they don't, uh, as far as I know, steel doesn't give you a certificate and say you are good to go. And, uh, you know, you're it's not a train the trainer or anything like that. But but um, instead of my caution is instead of saying, well, it's too much money because I'm going to it. I'm starting a training in January and it'll go all the way till April. And then I will be a, a certified trainer. Uh, but it's a twelve hundred dollar course. So, you know, these things aren't for everybody. But this is spelling, disaster cutting. This is all kinds of stuff. It's not just your basic. What most people at Woodbanks need, like you're saying, are the basic we we'll want to cut up logs. Uh, the big rounds we needed to cut again, those kinds of things. We're not we're not loggers. We're not dropping trees for pay. We're not, you know, we're not skidding logs, all that kind of stuff. But I think in a lot of places there would be resources for free um, safety awareness training from from dealerships and that kind of stuff, because they want everyone to operate, operate the equipment safely as well. Just a thought came to me. That's a good idea. Thank you. I would like to um, say I thought like information sharing would be great. Like what if we could have some either on the Alliance for Green Heat website, like what does every wood bank, you know, actually write it down? What do we operate? What would we feel are our, you know, most useful pieces of equipment? What do we feel? is not useful, you know, don't buy this. I'm sure I, I see, I wanted to mention to Pam, she probably sees a lot of stuff come through um, on the grant applications. And 
I just feel like it would be great to not have to reinvent the wheel. Like I learned at the national summit about the Halverson from the, uh, the green firewood ministry, green firewood ministry down in, down South. Um, and Sean and I are excited about trying this new Halverson piece of equipment out or trying to, um, bring one into our inventory. So just, um, information sharing, I feel like would be very useful in some, some way. Yeah, we totally agree. And we've been thinking about that and, and we need to get on it. <laughs> I think just having a, uh, yeah, like a document repository, um, or maybe highlighting, you know, kind of the best, and the best practices in various documents or something. Yeah. Do you have a suggestion, Kristen, of how to do that? What you'd what you'd like to see? Um, I don't. Maybe, maybe each wood bank, if there could be some form to fill out, um, listing your pieces of equipment that you're using, and maybe um, rank them in their usefulness some way. Um, and have that shared amongst wood banks or shared online somehow. Yeah, make That's the wood banks fill stuff out. <laughs> Put the burden on them. <laughs> okay, so that I I thought you were talking about like insurance documents, uh, but uh, yeah, there's I think any number of documents that we could share that would be really helpful. But if, um, yeah, it'd be, uh, I think we could do it. We just, you fill out a form and you choose the, the brand of like splitter you have and do a little review of it. I think that'd be great. Yeah, especially for startup wood banks, um, just knowing where to start from. Is there, a, you know, I'm a scientist, so I tend to th think about how to quantitatively analyze the, the equipment. And is there, a, is there a website to go to that actually, you know, tests them against one another? Because I, I feel like when I, whenever I'm talking to folks, you know, somebody says this splitter or this chainsaw they like and this one, I can't, and it's hard to, it's hard to ferret out, you know, what's real and what, what did the salesman tell them? And, you know, I just want, I wonder if there's a website that's maybe a place to go. Uh, there's, there's a variety of different wood, wood lot or wood, uh, um, firewood processors on YouTube. Right. And they all talk about different pieces of equipment. Uh, but I'm not aware of anybody actually doing a comparison that, that at least I thought was worthwhile. <clears throat> And I think oh. all of you have to take with a grain of salt. It's like one guy talking about Ford, one guy talking about Chevy. And, you know, he loves Chevy because his grandfather loved Chevy. Well, I have, uh, I got a lot of saws donated after one of the hurricanes. And it's a little, uh, about a 30, about a 30 horse echo or a 30 CC echo with 30 horse echo. That'd be a nice size echo. Um, and I'd never used an Echo before. I had always heard bad things about an Echo. But I thought, well, they're free. I'm going to use them. Man, they have been good little saw. A little Pico chain on it. And, I mean, the best thing about them is they were free. And I, when I say they, I got about 40 of them donated. And so from time to time, I would go to a church somewhere in the middle of nowhere and do a little safety training and then leave five or ten saws with them so they can do their thing. But... Now we're talking about liability. I maybe I need to change the name of our organization. They may come back on me after all that. But um, the point I'm making is, uh, Kevin's right. There are a lot of experts on YouTube that will tout this one or that one. Some of them will do some comparison. I spend a lot of time watching watching those uh, videos myself. But um, uh, yeah, you have to listen to Pam. You have to listen to a lot of people. 
uh, especially if you're not in that world. And uh, I'm not assuming that you're not in that world, but you said scientist. And so uh, I'm assuming you haven't run a chainsaw very long yourself. So you just, you have to get it from, from those who have. And I think just about any of those things will get the job done. Uh, like Kevin said, some have faster cycle flows, turnaround time, those kinds of things. Uh, this this engine runs better than that engine. Well, all of them operate pretty well if you change oil once in a while and you <laughs> run them out of fuel before you drive them down the road so they don't flood, you know, all those kind of things. So anyway, uh, my two cents on um, this equipment versus that equipment, but you do have to, you know, you have to knock on a lot of doors to find out that information if you're not from that world. Similar to YouTube, there's a couple of forum sites like arborsite.com and Firewood Hoarders Club that you can go into some deep black holes of information on splitters and axes and saws, and everybody has their favorites. Does anybody know of a website that has a .edu after it? Okay. What was the second one that you mentioned, Stephen? Firewood Hoarders Club. Firewood Hoarders. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to check those out. Um, well, I'm mindful of the time. I want to make sure that everybody gets gets back into their day after this great discussion. But this is really thought for pro thought provoking talk about um, all different kinds of equipment and practices. So I appreciate you all taking the time to to ask questions and offer ideas. Um, and Chrissy, I, I agree with you. I think that would be really helpful to have, um, information sharing in as many ways as we can in, in meetings like this one, but also in documents. So, um, yeah, I hope we can work on that. I think a Google form, sending out a Google form could be good and see what you get for responses yeah. and like That's what great. equipment, not just what you have, but what do you find most useful? What's yeah. What or what have you purchased that wasn't useful or yeah. Yeah. Especially cautionary tales. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd encourage all of you to, to join the Google group too. If you're, if you're into Google, um, the Google world, uh, and that, that I was hoping will be a place where we can share documents. If people want to share their, um, insurance policies or liability practices and also, I think it would be a great place to start a conversation about about what's great and what doesn't work for tools and equipment. So if you have any other um, questions or ideas as, as you think about this conversation, please don't hesitate to reach out and I hope we can address them in some other meeting like this or some, some future webinar. Um, any experts that you think would be useful to hear from, um, it would be great to to keep this conversation going and I'll, I'll be sure to share the recording and whatever, whatever information comes out of the, the meeting as we go on. So thank you again, everybody. What a great meeting. Take care. <laughs>